Galatians chapter 2 verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and community communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in to, in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now take note of that, bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these you seem to be somewhat, whosoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be in somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor the same, which I was also forward to do. And amen. We'll stop our reading there. You may be seated. I know the Lord will add his blessing, the reading of his perfect and his infallible word of God. We thank God for that. We've been going through the book of Galatians. We kind of stopped for the festive season there for Christmas. But we've been going through the book of Galatians, looking at something that's very important and uh, something that it's, it's something we need to know about. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul tells us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth now that's important it's a very important verse study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth now the bible has divisions in it okay the, the most obvious of, of course is the new testament and the old testament but going on from that the bible also has what we call dispensations and a dispensation is a, if you like, to make it simple, a period of time in which God deals with people in a certain manner. For instance, we call it the dispensation of innocence with Adam and Eve in the Garden of, of Eden. They didn't have the, the stresses and the things going on today. They were in a perfect environment. They had no television. They had no Wi-Fi. They had no distractions. They were in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. Until that slithering sake, the, the Satan or Santa came in and uh, got them to, to take of the fruit of the tree. So that was the innocent dispensation. Then is what we call the dispensation of the law. And that has to do with the law of Moses. And that lasted, Jesus said, for the law and the prophets and were up until John, John the Baptist. The law has a time, was a time of period when you followed the law. Now, when we say the law, we, we, we think of just the Ten Commandments. But there's a lot more to it than that. There was the moral law, which the Ten Commandments is the most obvious. There was the ceremonial law, and then there was the civil law. Jews, for instance, were told they were not to wear clothes. They were made up of different fabrics. And the reason why they, they, wanted, they didn't want people to cheat someone, saying, oh, this is all wool, when really it was part this and part that. It had to do with, you know, being honest. So there was the civil law. The ceremonial law that had to do with the temple, the sacrifices, the, the lamb, the, the different animals that were sacrificed, all pointing to the cross, amen? So it had to do with the ceremonial law. Part of that was, a, was what we call the Levite system, the Levitical system, the Levitical priests. Now the Bible says in Revelation that we are all priests of God, amen? But in the Old Testament, it was the Levites. And their job, if you like, is, is they, they, they helped with the sacrifices, they prepared them, they executed them, they, they sacrificed them, they offered them, and they, they, they dealt with them afterwards. Part of that was what we call the, 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 the tithe system. You may have read the Bible and if you heard about tithing. And some religions today and some groups today, even Christian groups, will tell you that, that tithing exists today. It is impossible to tithe today. Because the only person who you could tithe to was a Levite. And since there are no Levites today, 
there's no tithing. Now, you know, you, you can give 10% or 2% or 3% or whatever, that's between you and God. But under the Old Testament law, you had to give 10% and you had to give it to a Levite. That's the only person you could give it to. That's why, for instance, today, if you go to the Jewish people and ask them, do you tithe? They'll say, don't speak blasphemy. You can't tithe. It's impossible. There is no temple and there's no Levite. So you can't do that. That was all part of the law. We're in what's called the dispensation of the grace of God. We're saved by faith through grace. You don't have to, in the Old Testament, if you wanted to be saved, you had to become a Jew. You had to be circumcised. You had to go over and stay with the Jews. You had to be with them. That's how you got saved in the Old Testament. But today, you can be saved, be a Jew or Gentile, and we're all saved, amen. In fact, the Bible says in, in Colossians, that in the church, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all one in Christ. When a, when a Gentile, and that's someone who's not a Jew, comes to be saved, they repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're saved. When a Jewish person comes along to be saved, they repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're saved. There's no difference, amen? We're all saved the same way. So that's important, but when the church was beginning, and by, I don't mean a building, I don't mean a, an organization, I mean a, a groups of Christians. When it was first starting, you had a transition period. That's why, for instance, we don't get doctrine from the book of Acts. Because Acts is a transitional book. You're transitioning from a group of Jewish believers under who were keeping the law to the New Testament believers who were free in Christ and who did not keep the law as such like the Old Testament did. So that's important to realize. So when this was happening in, in Galatia, there was Paul went there and he preached the gospel. He, people were saved and he did a great job. But when he left, some people came along and said, yes, believe in Jesus, that's great. But you've also got to keep the law. Another group came along and said, yes, believe in Jesus, but you've got to be circumcised. I was witnessing to a young lady, uh, Ross and I were witnessing to a young lady yesterday, and she came up to me and said, well, I believe in Jesus, but I'm a Roman Catholic. And, you know, there are people in the Roman Catholic Church, I believe, who may be saved. I have no problem with that. But I said to her, I said, well, are you believing in Jesus only for your salvation? She said, no, no, I, I have the sacraments as well. And I said, no, 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 no. The Bible says we're saved by Jesus only, only by faith, not by faith plus baptism, by faith plus sacraments, by faith plus good works. Only Jesus. God does not need anybody's help to be saved. Amen. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need your help. He can do it all by himself. That's why we say Jesus saves. You were saved by faith alone. But people were coming along and they're saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Believe in Jesus. That's great. But also do this. There are people today who do, who do that as well. Uh, the, the example there of, of people in the Roman Catholic Church who will tell you that, yes, it's good to believe in Jesus, but you have to add things. There's also a group called the Church of Christ who say, yes, believe in Jesus, but you have to be baptized to be saved. Now, I believe in baptism, amen. It's, it's, a, it's a thing as, as Christians we ought to do is following the Lord. But you will never be saved in baptismal waters. We sang that this morning. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Baptismal waters do not save. They do not roll away or cleanse away sin. That happens when you invite Jesus in your heart to save you. So that's important to realize. And when Paul was dealing with this, that's the issue he was dealing with. He starts in chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, the best way to understand the Bible is by taking the Bible. Amen. You don't need me or a man or a commentator or anyone to explain things to you. The best explanation is found in the word of God. So let's find out exactly how, what happened here when he went up to Jerusalem by turning over to Acts chapter 15. So let's turn over to Acts chapter 15 and we'll see exactly what happened. Okay. Acts chapter 15, and we'll read, we'll read through this, but we'll read one bit at a time. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 through 6 says this, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, 
except you be circumcised after the manner of Mo after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Okay, so this is what we read in Galatians. They went up to Jerusalem after 14 years. So Barnabas and Paul and others, they went up to Jerusalem about this very question about do you need to keep the law and be circumcised to be saved? You see, all the, we know the answer. But this group of Christians, all their life had been taught, you've got to keep the law. And the Gentiles, they cannot be saved. So we're getting more Gentiles saved, so this question coming up. So verse number three. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God ha had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. So you had believers who were Pharisees. You remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a very strict religious Pharisee. He was a Hebrew. He was of Benjamin. So there was groups of Pharisees who believed, who said, yes, it's okay to believe in Jesus, but you also have to keep the law. You also have to be circumcised. Now, we could go into all different kind of studies about who the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, but there were two basic groups among the Jewish people at that time, the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, so they were Sadducees. They had no hope, so they were Sadducees. Just a joke there, thrown there for nothing. But basically, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They believed that when you did your deed, and that was that you had this life to live, and that was all there was to it. The Pharisees said, yes, there is a resurrection, and there will be a time when God will raise all the dead, and they will be judged. So when people believed in Jesus, they kept their baggage with them. Now, I remember many times growing up and going to airports many, many times. When I first started going on planes... I had a horrendous amount of baggage. You've no idea. When, when I first came back from America, back in donkey's years, I came back with about 15 trunks. I'm talking about wooden trunks, full of stuff. And part of the thing I had, I had my, my, my gun at the time. At that time, it was legal to have a gun, and, and he had a firearm certificate and all that. And I, I went to Presswick Airport, came through the airport, went through the Declare Channel, and, and, and was sitting there with all my trunks, and, and the guy said, well, what do you have to declare? I said, well, I have a gun. And you should have seen the look on his face. What? I said, yeah, it's in that, that box right there. And I showed him, it's my firearm certificate. Oh, okay, that's fine. And all the rest of that. And that was great. So I had like 15 trunks, and uh, that, another pastor picked me up, and he had a big van, and I, I loaded all my trunks Onto this van. Because I needed all that stuff. You know when I travel today. I'm lucky if I have a wee backpack like this. And you know spiritually speaking. When people first get saved. They have a lot of baggage with them. Amen. A lot of circumstances. A lot of life. A lot of past things that are going on. And as, as you grow in the grace of God. You learn to have less baggage. And travel light. These people who first got saved, they were Pharisees. And they were trying, and you've got to remember at this time that the New Testament wasn't written. This was like 10, 15, 20 years after the Lord had died. So, so they were going on what they knew from the Old Testament. So they were bringing that into the New Testament and they were getting confused. They just, just didn't understand. They were teaching that you have to be circumcised and keep the law and believe in Jesus. So this is something that had to be dealt with. And this is what they're doing in this council. Look at verse number 7 uh, in Acts chapter 15. For, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, if you go back in Acts chapter 10, you'll find what happened to Peter. Peter was sitting praying one day, and, and the Lord came to him in a vision, and he offered him, a, a basket full of food. Actually, it was animals. You know, it was basically food, meat. 
and he, the Lord said to Peter, rise up and eat. And Peter saw some of those animals. Now, I don't know what was in the basket, but perhaps it was bacon. Perhaps it was something, you know, that, you know, was a Jewish person wasn't supposed to eat. And the Lord said to him, he said, what God has cleansed, that call not thou unclean. And Peter was being shown by the Lord that the Gentiles, and that's the vast majority of the world, the Gentiles, when they heard the gospel, would believe. Now, that's something in our mind is, is simple. But in the Jewish mind of that time, the Gentiles were like, in fact, even today. Have you ever witnessed that in an Orthodox Jew? They call us Chonim, 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 which means Gentile dog. When, I, when I, Shortly after I first got saved, I was full of enthusiasm, and I, I, I decided, I'm going to tell the Jewish people about the Lord. So I went down to my local rabbi's house, chapped on the door. And the rabbi came to the door and said, yes. I said, I want to tell you about Jesus. Slam. <laughs> I was full of enthusiasm, you see, because I wanted to reach. But, you know, even today, if you, you see these Jewish people in all black and all the rest of them. If you go up and, and you tell them about Jesus, they'll cross you out. They've actually, uh, if, if I was to tell you some of the things they write about Jesus in their books, it would shock you. It would absolutely shock you, the things they say about our Lord Jesus Christ. They say the most, in, 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 in the, the Hebrew scriptures today, they say the most awful things about Jesus. I couldn't even repeat them at all. But if you tell them about Jesus, they don't want to know. And these were the kind of people, they, had, they wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. But God was opening the door so the Gentiles could be saved. And so there was a transition and people were, were going to understand that even the Gentiles could be saved. So Peter was got a vision from the Lord saying, what God has cleansed, call not thou unclean common. And let me say a word on that as well. When God saves you, he forgives all your sin. Amen. So that means all that's in your past should not affect your present or your future. Amen. What God has cleansed, that call not thou unclean or common. So Peter goes on and he says in verse number 8, and God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put, now this is important, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, we sit here in 2015, and that doesn't really bother us, but when Peter said this, this would be earth-shattering stuff. Earth-shattering. There would have been Jewish believers who, who would be holding their ears saying, that is terrible! To say that there's no difference between the Jewish people and the Gentile people in Christ. That was earth shattering. They were being beaten. You know, have you ever seen come, someone come to church and, and they get upset? So, it's not happened in a while, but you know, I've, I've had people come to church and, and they visit the church and I start preaching the Bible and they get red and you know they're mad and they're angry because they don't like to hear this. And we had a, a, a Many years ago, a woman came and she brought her daughter to church and she said, oh, this is great. This, my daughter needs to get some, something in her life because she was having problems with all kinds of things. And her daughter heard the gospel, came forward and get, and get saved. And uh, I dealt with her in the and got saved. And after she got saved, her mother came storming down the, 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 the daughter and ran out the church, angry that her daughter had received Jesus. There would have been people in this audience when Peter said this who were cringing, who were upset with Peter. Now look at verse number 10 where Peter says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Peter is saying, why would we give to the Gentiles the law of Moses and have them keep the law of Moses when we can't even keep the law of Moses? The reason why they had the sacrifice system was because of sin, and the sin had to be put off for another year. So they couldn't keep the law of Moses. So why would you give the Gentiles the law of Moses? Peter said, why would we do this to them? Verse number 11, Peter says, But we believe that through the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be see, saved even as they. This is important stuff. Now, there's not only Peter's response, there's Barnabas and Paul's response in verse number 12. Then all the audience kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. You know, when someone gets saved, it's a miracle of the grace of God. What miracles? It took a miracle, the song says, to save you and me. 
Paul told them about the great miracles, the great believers who were saved in Antioch and Galatia and, and Athenas and, and all these different places. God had done miraculous things. So all these Jewish Christians, the Pharisees, those who kept the law, were all there listening to this. Now James had a response in verse 13 through 21. Verse 13 says, And after they, they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as, is, as it is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Knowing unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So the result of this is James says the best thing for the, Jew, for the Gentile believers is that they keep themselves from idols, from pollutions of idols, from fornication and from blood. You notice there, there's no civil law. There's no ceremonial law. There's no Levitical system. There's no tithing system. None of that. Only that we, the Gentile believers keep themselves from idolatry, from fornication, and from pollutions of things like that. That's what was given to the New Testament Christians. And look at the response in verse number 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among them. After the, the, they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised to keep the law, to whom he gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have set therefore Judas and Silas, who shall tell you, also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye shall do well. So when they dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered multitude together, they delivered the epistle. So this was the result of those Judaizers who were sent and who supposedly said they were sent out to tell the people, yes, believe in Jesus, but keep the law and be circumcised. The elders and the apostles at Jerusalem said, no, 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 no. That's not for the Gentile believers. What's for them is that they keep themselves from idols, they keep themselves from blood, they keep themselves from fornication. And if we do that, we're doing well. That's why the Bible tells us in Christ, we do not keep the law of Moses. The ceremonial law and the civil law. Now the moral law is for everyone to keep, amen. Thou shalt not kill is still in effect, amen. It's still there. So then we go back to Galatians chapter 2. And we find out, you know, Paul had taken this letter from them. And he was delivering them to the people. But they were still going on, even then. Still going on. Uh, verse number 3 of Galatians chapter 2. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ, they might, that they might bring us unto bondage. You see, the law brings bondage. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 2, if, if you're going to keep the law, you've got to keep all the law, all the ceremonial law, all the civil law. But for us who are Gentiles, who us who have been saved, we are told that we just have to keep our liberty in Christ and follow the New Testament pattern and not keep the law, not the law of Moses as such. We are free in Christ. And the Lord said, whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Thank God we don't have to keep the law and the sacrifices and things like that. And the reason why is because these things will bring us into bondage. Now look what Paul said in verse number five. 
to whom we give place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, if you study about the Apostle Paul, you'll find he was a very gentle guy. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. He talks about love beareth all things, love covers all sin, love does this, that, and the other. So he was a very Gentile, gentle thing, person. He was, he was not a brash, going forward type. He was a very shy person. But Paul said, when they came with this gospel saying that you must be circumcised and you must keep the law, Paul said, I would even listen to them for an hour. Not even for an hour. When I, you know, people sometimes say, well, you know, it's good to go all the different churches and, you know, listen to what they have to say. Really? I think you should keep with the word of God, amen? Because a lot of times when you go mixed around with all these different churches with all these different gospels, you're going to hear a bunch of stuff that's going to bring them into bondage. Paul said that when these people came and they brought their gospel, I didn't even listen for an hour. Not even an hour. And the reason why is because he knew that people were looking at Paul and he didn't want people to think, well, if Paul can do that, I can do that. He said, I, want, I, want, I, I don't want to do anything that's going to bring you into bondage. In fact, these people were even in conference. Look at verses 6 and 7. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whosoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Well, let's have a conference about what the Bible really says and we'll look at all the different and, and, uh, things and beliefs and we'll bring them all together in one thing. Paul said all this stuff, that adds nothing to the gospel. You are better keeping with the simplicity and the clear preaching of the word of God than anything else. I, I do a lot of studying and things like that. And, and, you know, sometimes you'll meet people who will study the church fathers. I don't know if you've heard of the church fathers. Jerome, Origen, all these different guys, guys who wrote the first, second, the third century. And there's, there's all kinds of you know, theological guys they, they spend all, they don't read the Bible. That's the important thing. They study the church fathers. And that's, that's where you get Roman Catholic doctrine, by the way, by studying the church fathers. And they look and see what this church father said in the second century, this church father said in the third century, and this church father said in the fourth century. You know what? I don't give a monkey. I don't care what they say. All I care about is the word of God. That's it. I don't need to be in conference. I don't need to study all these superfluous things. All we need to study is the pure, clear word of God. And if you'll do that and you'll keep the simplicity in Christ, you'll do well. That's what was going on in Galatia. That's why we have to make sure we stand free in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this thy word this morning. We thank you've had the opportunity to study it, Lord, and see what happened in the past so that we might know what's going on in the future. Bless us, word to our hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the liberty we have in Christ. We're not under the ceremonial law, Lord. We're free to follow you and to glorify you in our lives. Bless us as we go our separate ways. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.